truly love him from the depths of your heart. He's so good. He's so good. Today I want to talk about called to flourish. Called to flourish. Psalm 92. And I'm going to be, uh, it's just a textual message straight from the Psalm 92. But I wanted to say to you, uh, we, wanted, we sang the song from the scripture today to encourage you to uh, ask the Holy Spirit to loose you to sing the Psalms. You know, uh, you understand the Bible, how many books that are in the Bible. The biggest book, the longest book, is a song book. And it's the middle of the scripture. The Psalms are the songbook, and God intends for us to sing. So I want to encourage you to do that. And I know my church knows that every once in a while I fall into the Psalms. Can't help myself. Uh, but today is Psalm 92. I was reading it this week, and, and uh, I saw it's labeled in, in my Bible. It says, it's a psalm for the Sabbath. A psalm for the Sabbath. And while the Sabbath is Saturday for our Jewish brethren, today is our Sabbath. And so this is a song for the Sabbath today. And it comes from Psalm 92, and I will have a few other scriptures, but always keep your finger in Psalm 92. So this is the psalm for the Sabbath, and it's called to flourish. Who can flourish? How do we flourish? What does it mean to flourish? The scripture talks about flourishing in the Lord. Now, if you have, a, you have your bulletin, and that's the reason for this picture, because God says we're like a cedar tree. So that's pretty strong, isn't it? If you look at the bulletin and you see that, that's how God sees us. Now, we don't feel that way, but he sees us that way because he lives in us, and he empowers us to be strong and powerful. And this is about the psalm. It's in the psalm that we will come to. So he wants us to flourish like this. He wants us to see ourselves as bold and devoted and developing spiritual things so that we can be a stronghold for the kingdom of God. So who can do, who can do all this? That's what we're going to talk about today. You know, the opposite of flourish is deadness. The opposite of, of flourish is the doldrums. Anybody ever have the doldrums? I don't know what they are, but I know I've had them. <laughs> that opposite of, of flourish is lack of energy toward the Lord. I'm talking spiritual today. And uh, lack of uh, flourishing is that we're not thriving at the place where God wants us to thrive. Because even if today is glorious and great and we're thriving, he wants us to be better tomorrow. He wants us to be thriving and thriving and growing. And so if we look at Psalm, uh, first two Psalms, Psalm 92, 1 and 2, it's a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord. We sang this this morning. And to sing praises unto thy name, O Most High. Nothing higher than him. And he lives in you. So there's a height in you that overcomes the power of darkness. And the scripture goes on to say, to show forth thy loving kindness in the morning, and thy faithfulness every night. I think the Spirit of the Lord is saying, get up with the joy of the Lord and go to bed with thanksgiving. Now, church, honestly, I think I can, I think I can go to bed with thanksgiving. But this getting up with joy in the morning, <laughs> that is another thing. You know, but we need to practice those things. We need to go against the flesh I had an amen there. Amen. Go against the flesh and, and get into the joy of the Lord because he wants us to be faithful in joy and he wants us to be faithful in thanksgiving. Now, verse 3 says, the word, this, this is the word that sets the pace for this message. And it's a meditative music, if you notice this. He calls it a solemn sound. I thought, what is, a so what is rejoicing? First, I'm talking about rejoicing, and then I'm talking about a solemn psalm. So I looked this up, and it, it, it means a quiet, a meditative, worshipful attitude. So God wants us to have that kind of attitude instead of the attitude of stress and anxiousness and all those kinds of things that how many know the devil is always on your shoulder 
always seeking to rob you of that soundness, of that sweetness, of that quietness, always blaring at you, harassing you. And that's okay because we are going to overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony, and we're not going to love our lives, our flesh, more than we love God. So we've got to remember that, church. And so uh, this glorious sound, so verse 4 says, For thou, Lord, hast made me glad. How many in this were, were room is glad? Do you come glad? Are you glad for the day? Are you glad to pay your bills? <laughs> you know, see, so you've got to be glad in all circumstances, not just not just the good things, not when you just get a tax relief or something. No, no, that's good, that's glad, but glad when things don't go right because the Spirit of the Lord lives in you and he demands us to have a better attitude than the flesh in which we live. And, and I'm speaking to myself too, church, but you know what, this is the hour in our day that we have got to strengthen our inner man. We've got to awaken, not just be revived and run the aisles, you know, and then go home and be tired, but to be revived in our spirit, man, so that we are empowered and we're going to be strong and be a witness for God. So the verse 4 says, Thou hast made me glad. You know, he has to make us glad because our, our flesh doesn't want to be flat, glad. Our flesh wants to see everything negative. Our flesh wants to do its own thing, which not always pleases God. You know, so he wants us to be glad, to, to, to feel his power of his presence. Now it says, for the Lord has made me glad. How has he made you glad? Through the power of his work. Not only the work that he's done in your life in the past, not only the work he's doing now in your life, and not only the beautiful works that he's prepared for us to live in, the mountains, the hills, the rails, all of the goodness, and we're coming into fall now and the beautiful colors. So, you know, God just works at every area to make us happy and to be fill us with his glory and his praise. So verse 4 says, Thou hast made me glad. If you're not glad, you're not listening to the Lord because he wants to make us glad. And he says, and then it, the scripture goes on to say, verse 4, I will triumph in the works of thy hands. I will triumph in the beauty of everything he's created. I will triumph in the fact that he created me. I will triumph in the fact that he lives in me. If he lives in me, I will overcome. If he doesn't live within me, I don't know about what happens there. But I can tell you that if he lives in you, he has promised that we will overcome those things that the enemy puts against us. So to triumph is to have joy and gladness and delight and, we, and to know that we are winners in Christ. And I tell you something, in this very season that we're in, in our government and in our country and even in our lives, you know, we don't feel triumphant. We don't feel triumphant. We, you know, things are just so bleak, if you, especially if you watch the news on TV. And not only the TV, but advertising and all of those things. Everything is negative and means to bring you into a place of harassment to keep you from the joy of the Lord. And so as we look at this, we see that we will triumph in the work of his hands. What is he doing in your life? You know, when you have a trial or a tribulation, you put that in his hands. And it becomes he works for you. He helps you. He brings you through. And it's really important, church, that we understand that if we can have a glad spirit, a delightful spirit, a joyful spirit, we will triumph in the things that the enemy brings against us. And, you know, we will win because if you've read the book of Revelation, we are the winners. And we don't always walk around thinking, oh, I'm a, win I'm a winner. I'm in victory. You know, because we evaluate ourselves by other things. We evaluate ourselves by other people. We evaluate ourselves by material things. We're always evaluating everything. You know, but we need to know that we are in the hands of God. And when we evaluate him, we belong to the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And there's no higher power than our God. 
And we need to dwell in that church. The enemy is trying to divide the church and bring the church down and close the church doors. And, and some people have never gotten over what happened. They're, they're still in their pajamas with their coffee and watching TV and thinking they're in the presence of the Lord. Well, they, maybe they can be, I don't know. But I know this, that the word of God says, and even in this chapter today, we will see that he wants us to gather together. And we feel that when we come into his house. Maybe things didn't go good this week, but we come in here, we shake hands, we smile, sometimes we hug, you know, and we get, we're, we're a family. And, and, and I love my family. I've been with my family Saturday. But, you know, there's something about coming into the family of God that is supernatural. It's more than the, the true family. And we love our families. We love our families with all our heart. But, you know, there's a lot of work in our families. A lot of prayers needed in our families, you know, and a lot of stress and anxiety is there in our families. But when you come in the house of God, you can feel the power and the presence of the Lord. And if somebody feels anxious, somebody's bound to say to you, God bless you, how are you doing? And then that anxiety is, is tempered by the power and the presence of God. So the psalmist wants us to sing. He wants us to sing. The biggest thing in our Bible is the songbook in the middle. He wants us to sing his praises because in singing his praises, he inhabits our praise. He inhabits us and he reminds us that he is higher than the difficulties that the enemy has placed in front of us. Psalm 106, 47, don't leave 92 now, but Psalm 106, 47 says, Save us, O Lord. We read it in our devotion this morning. O Lord, our God, gather us. From among the heathen. See, what they did is they divided the church, took them to the TV, and there's good things on TV, but there's also bad things on TV. And I see now that even the religious stations got their advertisements for their things, you know. And so how can you be in the presence of the Lord and then all of a sudden you got to hear about books and, and all kinds of things, you know. Because in the house of God, you, you uh, focus in on the presence of the Lord in his house. And so the psalmist said there, gather you from among the heathens, give thanks and triumph in thy praise. When you get discouraged and despondent, God is saying, okay, I'm giving you an opportunity to triumph. I'm giving you an opportunity to overcome. I'm giving you an opportunity to grow. I'm giving you an opportunity here. And he, I pray that he shakes me. I want to be shaken that, that I can understand that he has given me an opportunity to overcome because that's what our salvation is, overcoming by the blood of the Lamb. And so verse 5, 92, 5, it says, O Lord, how great are thy works. Did you ever just stop in your tracks and say, oh God, how great are your works in my life. You brought me through this. You brought me through that. You know, some preachers say, don't look back. But I say what? Look back and give thanks. Look back and thank God that he saved you and brought you forth and healed you and made a new life for you or whatever it is that you went through that hurt you so much. Just give thanks to God because he is overcoming the power and the harassment of the enemy. And so it says, how great are thy works. How how deep are thy thoughts? You know, God is very serious about our troubles. He does not take our troubles lightly. He does not take those things that torment us lightly. He has deep thoughts about us. His thoughts are, will they overcome? Will they see what I'm doing in, in their life? Will they mature? Will they grow? He's, he's, he's pleading for the body of Christ to rise to adulthood, to, to, to grow and be stronger because that's what we're facing today. That's why we have these problems and difficulties because he's building in us an energy to be overcomers for the glory of God. So it's important. God does not take things lightly. Sometimes you think somebody comes along and says, well, I'll pray for you, and you feel that's sp spoken to you lightly. But I tell you what, God never takes your problems lightly. He, he watches to see if you can overcome and if you can mature and grow. Now, verses 6 and 7, this is so unique because you got to this in Sunday school. Sunday school was about forgiveness. It was about sin. It was about overcoming. How many, how many remember what Sunday school was? Okay. <laughs> and now we're in the Psalms, and you're going to see the same thing because the next few verses is about the brutish man 
the people that don't obey God. And uh, it says they, they will flourish in evil. Do you ever just look at a neighbor or somebody who is just mean and they just, they just get everything goes good for them. They're, they get good, better jobs. They got better cars. They got better houses. Everything you can see. They flourish. Yeah, yeah. They grow in evil. But the Bible says that and when that happens, they're going to be destructed. Destructed. And, and it's so, so important. It says, uh, it's the verse 6 and 7. talks about the brutish man. The brutish person is cruel, brutal, coarse, bully. He's a bully, and he's very dangerous. He's, he's, he's mentioned in the class of fools and wickedness. And it says, and this is the word of God, when they flourish in evil, they shall be destroyed forever. So when you see that, instead of thinking, why do they look so prosperous in my eyes, why do they look so prosperous and I, I'm not quite as prosperous as them, then you understand that they are headed for destruction and you need to pray for them. Because without God, they're not going to have eternal life. The only thing that is prosperous is eternal life. You know, the, the, we walk through this life and God gives us goodness. He gives us beauty. He watches over us. He takes care of us. But our destination is eternal. And so the, the brutish individual or the I evil individual that cannot come into forgiveness, like Hosea taught, you know, Hosea had to suffer those things. And you might have to suffer some things. Jeremiah 12, I love this because Jeremiah is a favorite prophet of mine and he's so powerful. And then he weeps so much in the Lamentations. I like him a lot. And so it says in Jeremiah 12, 1, he says, Why does the way of the wicked prosper? See, we're not alone in this. It says, why does the way of the wicked prosper? Therefore are all they happy that deal treacherously. See, I, this is what the word of the Lord is saying to us. You know, but if you read that whole passage there, God will give them another opportunity. Just like he, all through Hosea, he was given an opportunity for, the, for Israel to be forgiven. And I just thought, how interesting is that, that she's in Hosea, and I see the same message in the Psalms. That's what God does. He gives a revelation every time you sit down to study his word. So I love this, and it says, but verse 17 of Jeremiah 12 says, after, after he's tested them and he's given them second chances, God's a, God's a God of second chance. Then verse 17 says, but if they will not obey, I will utterly pluck them up and destroy them. And that's where our nation is. You know, our nation is on the verge of being plucked up if God doesn't redeem it. And as long as there are those hot spots of prayer teams praying across the nation, the devil's going to have a hard time of destroying the United States of America because God hears the prayer and God is serious when we pray for our nation. Verse 8 and 11, it says, The word declares, Lord, how, how, Lord, how you are most high forevermore. The enemy of the Lord shall perish, and the workers of iniquity shall be dis, uh, scattered. Verse 10 says, But my horn shall thou exalt like the horn of the unicorn. Now, church, sometimes we read those things, we just go over and we don't stop to think, what does all that mean? And I, I searched it out because, of course, I know, understand what horn is. Horn in Scripture is authority and power. And they talk about the revelation, and Daniel talks about all the enemies that we're going to face and the horns and all of that sort of stuff. So I just want to stop and say that the horn is authority and power. And we have authority and power in God. I don't think Christianity understands that like they should. Because it, 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 that's how we overcome, is having a power and authority in God. That's how we flourish. It's the righteous that flourish, as we will see as we go on into this passage of Scripture. But we shall be strengthened as that of a unicorn. I don't know what that means. But a unicorn has a horn. And I'm sure that the, the theologians think that it's, I don't know if you've ever been in Africa or you saw these Africa animals, they have a real hard front head and that sometimes uh, ant antlers or uh, horns and <coughs> they're, um, they're like an ox or they're like, 
uh, a wild buffalo. They're, they're not the buffalo that we see, you know, in, in the States, but they are huge. I've seen them. I've been in Africa. They're, they're, they're frightening. And uh, that's all that I know that the theologians say that it's a type of a huge, strong animal. So what are we saying here? We're saying then that the Lord is telling us that we have authority and strength and we're powerful in God. We might be, excuse me, <coughs> we might be weak in spirit. We might be weak in various things in our life. But you know what? When we rise to the occasion and understand who we are in God, we are strong we have authority. You know, when the enemy comes to harass you, you have authority to cast him out. The same authority when Jesus said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. We have that same authority. And instead of uh, laying around in that fear and anxiousness and anxiety, we need to speak to it and know that we have authority and power in God. We don't have authority and power to display our proudness. We have authority and power to display the power of God that lives in us. And the church needs to recognize how powerful in God that we are if we will mature in him and if we will hear the word of the Lord and be powerful and sing our song of victory. I want to give you an assignment right here. I would like to see everybody... Pick a psalm this, year, this week and sing it. And next Sunday, I'm going to say, who sang their song? Because it's the strength that goes before the battle. If you've ever read about David, they sent all the singers and the musicians before the swords. So what happens is if you do that, you stave off the enemy before he even gets to you because you've already prepared the path for the presence of God when you sing. I want to get the church just singing powerfully because that is going to help us in overcoming in the days ahead. So, uh, so we got strength. We got authority in the Lord according to this uh, psalm. It's so great. And it means that, uh, and it's finally the scripture says, and we shall be anointed with fresh oil. Do you see that? Oh, we need the oil of heaven. We need that fresh oil. There is authority and power in the believer against the power of darkness. You know, for years they were taught about the authority and the power of the believer. But that authority and the power of the believer is to overcome the powers of darkness. It's not to get what you want. It's to overcome the darkness that the enemy wedges against your mind and against your spirit and against the God that lives in you. So I'm not, I'm not against uh, the power of the believer, you know, but I'm saying to you that it's more than just wanting things and commanding things. It's believing that God will be you in those dark moments of your life when you need it. So it's a very, very important. Well, I don't know. I've been inspired these last few weeks, and I, I have too long of a sermon. I might have to do part two. But um, Hebrews 1.9 says, Thou hast loved righteousness. It's the righteousness that causes you to flourish in the Lord. And um, is there a time or a time in your life when you might have just wanted to give up? You went through a terrific trauma in your life and you just go, what's the sense? I think every Christian has experienced that because that's what the devil wants to harass us with. But you know what? Somehow you're here today and you overcame that. And you have to understand how you overcame it. You overcame it because the oil of the spirit that was in you rose to the surface and you didn't even know that he was helping you overcome it. But you overcome because the word of God lives in you. You cannot not overcome if the true word of God is standing in you and if you're in right standing. You know, the Bible talks about it's the righteous Verse 12, the righteous shall flourish. What does righteous mean? It means being right, standing with the Lord. It means that you go to bed thanking God and you rise up uh, thanking God and you, you have a tentative spirit that will forgive and you want to walk in the presence of the Lord. And so you seek and yes, and you want to grow and be like the um, 
cedar tree. And it's really great if you seek out the cedar tree. I don't have time to go into it, but the cedar tree can live. The latest one that they have on history was 3,000 years. Lived a long time. And also, the natives that lived around this, in in Lebanon, that's in Israel, the people that lived around it, they could make clothing out of it. They could make medicinal purposes out of it. They They lived by that tree. People should live by the tree in us because we are, we are the branches of the vine. So it's, it's important. There's so much to be said when you start to take a scripture apart and look for it and to, to, to fulfill it in it. But anyhow, the, there's three things I want to say to you before I get to the end. Um, they call that tree that you have in the bulletin, uh, in the front of the bulletin, they call it the eternal tree the tree of God. And that's what it's called in the flesh. But, you know, we're talking spiritual today. We want to be trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord. That's who we are. Now, there's three things that we need to flourish. One, we need to grow. Two, we need to grow grow in the Lord, grow in spiritual things. The church has been anemic for a long time. The Church of Jesus Christ at large has been anemic for a long time. They need to get some blood in them, and they need to get some strength in them, and they need to get some boldness in them, and they need to realize that wherever we are in the Spirit, we need to grow, and we need to do more. There's more. There's always more in God, so we need to grow. And secondly, we need to develop spiritually. The body of Christ needs to develop spiritually. It's not just for the preacher or the evangelist. It's for the body of Christ. Every one of you are ministers in some form. You might be a minister to your family. You might be a minister on the street. You might be a minister in the prison. You might be a minister that just walks around with the glory of the Lord and people think you're weird and stop and talk to you and then you can testify to them. You know, but you're all called of God you know, you're called to flourish, you're called to, to be bold, you're called to grow in the God that next, next year when you meet that you're more powerful in the spirit than you were today because you're growing spiritually and you're developing spiritual thoughts. I don't know, as a child, I used to sit among the women at prayer meeting, you know, they took, you know, your kids had to go wherever you went and I had a blanket under the seat, and I heard him pray, and I heard him talk, and I, and you know, I, I heard so much, and it brought develop to my life, even as a young person. And when you stand around and you talk about the good things of God in the midst of children or your family or your friends, you, they will grow. They will learn something from you because everyone has something to give of God. So we're looking to grow, we're looking to develop spiritually, we're starting to have spiritual eyes, we're starting to discern and to see things in the spirit. And if we don't, we need to ask God, we say, God, show me things in the spirit, help me to have a discerning spirit, fill me unto overflowing with the power of your presence that I might be be useful in the kingdom of God. You don't have to be a preacher to be useful. You don't have to be anybody up front or anything but just your life, the light that shines in you is useful for the kingdom of God. And the third one is bold. We need to be extravagant in our actions for God. Extravagant. I don't even know what that means, but I know it's powerful. We need to be extravagant in our boldness for the Lord. I don't mean stand up in the middle of the aisle in the supermarket and, you know, go off with a big scripture, but... What I'm saying is that God will give you opportunities right in the marketplace. You're walking down. Somebody will reach for something. They can't reach it. Would you reach it? Gives you opportunity to have a conversation. Gives you an opportunity to be bold. To just let let the glory of the Lord shine. Because in helping, you are doing something spiritual. You're portraying Christ. I believe that Christianity should wake up and be more useful uh, to the kingdom of God. I, I want to do that. People of God are called to flourish, and the righteous will flourish. The Bible talks about he wants us to be like cedars of Lebanon strong. Do you feel that strong today? Are you a ministering tree? Can they get help from you? Can they get, can they get uh, blessings from you? Can they get, if, if somebody needs prayer, don't say, well, yes, I'll pray for you. Just say, may I pray right now? We want to be bold. We want the world to know we're a Christian. 
If they're taking the Lord's name in vain, we let them know. We let them know with love and kindness and gentleness, but we let them know because we're bold. We're, 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 we're different. We're peculiar. We're set apart. We have the anointing of God, the fresh oil of God in us. Romans 12.10 says, this is how, and oh, I forgot 13, sorry. Verse 13 says, those that be planted, these are who can flourish. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish. You see what? See what I'm saying? If you're planted in the house of the Lord, there's flourishment. I don't know if, there's, if you'll flourish in front of the TV, but, but you might. I'm talking about religious TV. I, I'm thankful that people get saved that way, and I'm thankful that it, it does do good. But I'm talking to Christians today that we need to be the family of God and obey the word of God. So listen, that's what it says, verse 13. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall gather it shall flourish in the courts of God. That which is planned, you know, that which is planted must have care. There must be water and sunshine and get the weeds out and all that. And that's what we do as a family of God. We, 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 we minister to one another. And it's so, that's so important. And how important it is is found in Romans 12.10. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love. In honor, preferring one another fervent in spirit, I'm talking about building our spirit, bold in spirit, you know, growing in the spirit and doing those things that please the Lord. So it says, in honor, preferring one another, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Verse 12 says, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation. Oh, Jesus, help me. And continuing instant in prayer. That's what I'm saying. Somebody needs prayer, give them prayer. You keep, your, keep your spirit man full so that a given moment it can do it. Be instant in season with the power and the anointing of God. But you know, you have to be able to rejoice in hope and be patient in tribulation and constant in prayer. These are the things that got, belong in the body of Christ. And it talks about verse 14 and 15 and 92 about being charitable and hospitable and bless them. You know, bless them that curse you and be good to them that despitefully use you. Those are the hard things, isn't it? I tell you what, I have had a hard time with them. But, you know, when you overcome, it feels so good. It's so hard to overcome, but when you overcome, it feels so good. So 14 and 15 is the charitableness. Verse 15 says, rejoice with them that rejoice. And weeping with them that weep. That's all in, I believe it's in either Romans or 92. I don't have it called here. But you're called to uh, flourish in the house of the Lord. There's no timetable in serving Jesus. So I love this passage of scripture. And it's the final one. And it says they shall bring forth fruit in their old age. That's me. I hope I can do that. See, there's no timetable. People retire from jobs, but you can't retire from Christianity. You can't retire from following Christ. You might want to and you might try, but it won't work. It says, there shall, they shall still bring forth fruit in their old age. I'm going to leave out one word. They shall be full and flourishing. You know, it says the A-F-A-T word, but I don't like that word. You know, so I'll, I'd rather be full. <laughs> oh, Jesus, help me. And flourishing. And verse 15 says, To show that the Lord is upright, he is my rock, and there are no unrighteousness in him. Is that not awesome, church? So I tell you today, you're called to flourish. That means you're called to grow in God. That means you're called to think spiritually on occasion. That means you're called to be bold, never back away from the things of God. So I want to say to the church today, cast off the doldrums, if you know what they are and if you have them, and energize the Holy Spirit that lives in you so that the oil will be fresh and it will pour out quickly and it will meet the needs of the Lord. Now, Remember what the word says, the, the place to flourish is in the house of the Lord. 
So whatever house of the Lord you go in, you just go to worship Jesus, you'll flourish. And that is what we want to do. Father, we love you this morning. Father, if there be any discouragement in the house, we rebuke it in Jesus' name. We ask, Lord, that you would speak peace, that, that you would pour forth this oil upon us, that we can be bold for you, that we can, Father, grow. We, we need to grow in you because, Lord Jesus, we're warriors for the faith. We need to be able to stand strong, Lord. We need to be able to sing our song, Father God. We need to be able to find hope in the psalms that you've given us the songs that you have given us lord the encouragement and the and the things that we have there so lord we just thank you for the fact that you want us to flourish and you love us and you forgive us and you help us to grow we ask you to bless the tithe and the offerings today father god and just let the love of jesus flow through this place in jesus name we ask it bring your